So I've been developing web apps for almost five years now, and that has been fun, but what's been more fun is developing mobile apps. When I got into mobile app development in 2023, I instantly fell in love with it to the point where I started building random applications that didn't make sense. But my most recent mobile app, CalQuest, that did make sense, hopefully. I made a video about it about a month or two ago, and it sparked a very common question, which is, what tech stack do you use to develop your mobile apps? And frankly, I know that's a question a lot of developers don't typically like answering because technically, the tech stack you use doesn't matter. Just use whatever works for your use case. But since you guys asked, let's get into it. For those of you guys who don't know who I am, my name is Levi. I'm a software engineering major at the University of Cincinnati, go Bearcats, and I'm a software engineering intern at a fintech company. So I pretty much make videos about software engineering, college, and life. So if that interests any of you guys, please consider subscribing. All right, so let's get into the fun stuff. So earlier I mentioned I started off as a web developer and I used React to develop pretty much all my web applications. So when I decided that I wanted to venture into mobile app development, the no-brainer choice had to be the React Native framework. For those of you guys who don't know what React Native is, it's pretty much React for mobile apps. It abstracts all the platform-specific complexity behind developing apps for Android and iOS, and it lets you write your code using JavaScript and React components, which then runs natively on both Android and iOS, so you don't have to build two separate applications. But my tech stack doesn't just end at React Native. If I was to build an application like, let's say, Instagram, I can achieve all the functions and features of Instagram with just React Native alone. For example, backend implementations, notifications, fonts, icons, all that jazz. There are libraries and tools in my tech stack that helps me develop a full stack functioning mobile application, if that's an actual word full stack functioning mobile application i probably invented that word it would also do you guys good that i explain what expo is because a lot of my tools and functionalities that i use in my tech stack are from expo so expo is pretty much a framework and platform built around react native it provides a bunch of pre-configured tools libraries and workflows that simplifies the mobile development process especially when you're just getting started or you want to move fast without diving into the native code. You can still choose to develop without Expo, but my tech stack and workflow heavily depends on Expo, so we're going to be talking a lot about Expo. So this is what we're going to be covering in today's video. We'll be talking about the standard stuff like backend and database. We're going to talk about that real quick. Then we'll talk about the other tools I use for functionalities that make a full stack application. I'm talking about functionalities like push notification, authentication, image upload, and storage which is something a lot of people implement wrong, so we're going to be looking at that. We're also going to be looking at data synchronization and offline support. Then lastly, we're going to be looking at libraries I use for fonts and icons. That's a lot of things we need to talk about, so let's get into it. Now, for my backend process, I follow an API-driven development, meaning I develop API endpoints and I call them from my React Native front end. I mainly develop all my backend services with PHP and MySQL, but I've been messing around with c .net lately, and it's proven to be somewhat better than PHP when it comes to building out API endpoints. But for now, I still write all my backend logic with vanilla PHP, no framework. Um, PHP talks with MySQL database and my client React Native communicates with my backend through an API endpoint. Pretty simple, nothing complicated. I'll sometimes introduce Redis cache into that flow if my clients will be making a lot of data calls to the database so that that way I avoid unnecessary repeated reads on the database, but it's only for very few use cases. I think it's also important that I say that my choice for backend implementation heavily depends on what I'm building. There are some very small applications or small projects that I work on that don't need me to develop and a whole API endpoint for, so I just use services like Superbase or sometimes Firebase as my backend service. Superbase is really nice if you guys haven't tried it out. It's basically the SQL version of Firebase. All right guys, real quick, before I jump into how I built my push notification, authentication flow, and image handling, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Hostinga. Hostinga Horizon is basically your all-in-one AI partner. It's a designer, developer, and copywriter in one tool. You just type your idea and literally in plain English, just type your idea in plain English and it literally builds a working mobile friendly website or web application with no coding needed. The cool part is that you can tweak layout, rewrite sections, add features just by chatting with it. It even connects with platforms like Stripe which enables you to handle payments and charge for your products or ideas 
or Superbase, which allows your clients or your users to authenticate and log into your application. Horizon provides these integrations right out of the box, and when you're ready, you just launch it with a click. No DevOps or server headaches, allowing you to save tons of money because you don't need to hire expensive developers. Whether you're building a landing page, a dashboard for your application, or testing a new product idea, Horizon can get you live today not six months from now. There is a seven day trial, a 30 day money back guarantee and 247 expert support. If you have an idea you've been sitting on, this is your sign to launch it. Click the link in the description and use my code Levi to get 10% off your yearly subscription with Hosting Our Horizon. All right, now let's get into the part of the tech stack that really makes every mobile app unique. So starting off with authentication, when it comes to authentication, my approach really depends on the type of application I'm building. If it's a simple application with basic functionalities, I usually go with something like Clerk. It takes care of authentication out of the box and makes social login super easy to set up. But for more complex applications like my recent app CalQuest that has a whole onboarding process i need tighter control over you know sessions permissions or how the authentication flow behaves so i would rather build my own authentication system from scratch now this topic is pretty controversial amongst developers everyone has their strong opinions on what's best personally i think you should just use whatever you're comfortable with and more importantly whatever gives your users the best experience but i'll say if you're trying to play it safe and you're looking for a secure authentication and also good user experience i would say click is your best bet. Clerk is a more modern authentication library. They're pretty known for their sleek user interface and also authentication experience. But there are also other authentication tools out there like Superbase, which is also cool. But if you're like me that prefers building out your own authentication flow, I would say building out my own authentication flow is definitely more complicated than it sounds because I have to manage everything that tools like Clerk or Superbase usually handles for you out of the box. Things like session persistence, token refresh, secure storage, and all that backend jazz. That being said, I've done it enough times now that it has kind of become muscle memory. Unless something randomly decides to break one day, then it's just me, Google, and vibes trying to figure it out. <laughs> now let's talk about push notifications. This is a functionality that scares a lot of developers. At least it scared me when I started developing mobile apps. And the reason is that handling notifications natively without any tools is frustrating. You need to figure out, you know, notification permissions, device tokens, then how to trigger the notifications and send them to the user. It's kind of complicated, honestly. That's where using development tools like Expo comes in clutch. Using Expo notification with very few lines of code, you can request a device notification permission, get the token, and you can do whatever you want with the token, which will be storing it in a database and, and associating it with a user ID. Sending notifications is also really simple. Using the Expo notification SDK, they provide a method where you just passing the user's device token along with the title and the message of the notification and it sends that notification instantly. It's super straightforward and it works great for most use cases. Now, when it comes to how I implement notification and how notifications typically work in general, there are usually two things involved a trigger and a process that runs continuously or on a schedule to check for that trigger. For example, in my most recent mobile app, CarQuest, I send user notification reminders at set times if they haven't logged their meals. And in this case, the trigger is a specific time of the day and the user's meal login status. So if it's midday and the user hasn't logged lunch yet, that triggers a notification. To make this happen, I have a cron job that runs every hour. It checks whether the user has logged their meals. So if it's noon, and the user hasn't logged their mails, it hits an API endpoint that uses Expo SDK to send the push notification. Trust me, using Expo notification saves you so much time when it comes to implementing notifications in your mobile apps. I really don't know how people do it without Expo. Um, people who use Flutter or even develop natively, like I don't even know how you guys do notifications. Please let me know in the comments for sure. Now, moving on to image uploads and storage. This is something I've always like i'm not even joking like always done wrong for a very long time and didn't even realize it a lot of applications involve image uploads whether it's setting a profile picture or sharing a picture with a friend or uploading some kind of content but how you process and store those images matters a lot, especially for performance and also storage efficiency. In my case, for my tech stack, whenever a user uploads an image, it first compresses it using Expo Image Picker to reduce the file size. Expo Image Picker is a must because the, the library has some kind of image processing going on behind it that you can pretty much set, you can set um, a quality value. So you can set a quality value from zero to I think from zero to one, so 0 
would reduce the quality of the image and one is going to upload the image in full quality. So this would only work if you're using Export Image Picker. But when the user selects an image using the Export Image Picker and the whole compression process is done, I upload that image to an AWS S3 bucket and store the URL in my database. If the user updates that image in the future, I delete the old one from the S3 bucket and replace it with a new image using the exact same key so everything stays clean and organized. And when a user deletes an image, I also remove it from the S3 bucket to free up space. The really cool thing about this approach is that it keeps everything clean and scalable. You're not like cluttering up your storage with old and um, unused images and using the same key for updates makes it so much easier for you to allow the user to update their image but also delete the image it just makes the management super simple now moving on to data synchronization and offline support offline support is something a lot of people don't implement in their mobile applications but it's really important we do so for better user experience it can be complicated depending on how you're implementing it but it's definitely worth it. For offline storage, I try to keep things very simple and effective. So what I do is I store a snapshot of all the data needed to load the application the last time the user was online. So let's say you have your phone, you open my application. Once you open the application on your online, the application takes a snapshot of all the data it needs to load the application and store it in the async storage. So when the user opens the application the next time and they don't have internet connection, the app just pulls that stored snapshot from the async storage and renders it to the user, giving them a seamless offline experience. I don't have to worry about data synchronization conflicts because the app doesn't allow users to create or modify data while offline. All they can do is read what's already there. Then when the user comes back online, the app fetches the latest data from the server updates the UI and saves a new snapshot for when next they go offline. Pretty simple, it's actually not that complicated thinking about it now. Lastly, let's talk about font and icons. In my opinion, they are like the cherry on top of a well-built application. The app can be fully functional, but the right font and the right icons can take the user experience from good to great. For icons, I use React Native Vector icons, specifically the ones included in the React Native Element Library. It gives me access to a huge collection of clean modern icons out of the box. It's really perfect for building intuitive UIs without having to hunt for custom SVGs. Now, when it comes to fonts, here's how it works in React Native. By default, your app uses the system fonts, so it will look different on Android compared to iOS. But if you want a custom font, you can import it manually using the Use Expo Fonts module if you're using Expo. Honestly, if, if you're not using Expo, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how it works. <laughs> but with Expo, it's actually pretty straightforward. You just import the font files into your project, load them using the Use Fonts from Expo Fonts, and once the fonts are loaded, you can apply them throughout your application. I'm not going to lie, I'm actually still exploring how to use fonts more effectively, but just swapping out the default system fonts with something more intentional already makes the app feel more polished. But yeah guys, that's my complete tech stack for mobile app development. Let me know if you guys have any questions about my tech stack, let me know in the comment section. Also, there's going to be a link in the description for you to sign up for my latest application, CalQuest. If you don't know what CalQuest is, I'm going to link a video somewhere here talking about the application. But yeah, thanks again guys for watching. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe if you guys found it helpful. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Peace.